Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program. John Russell reports on President Biden's upcoming trip to Vietnam. Brian Lynn has a story on how Maine's population of puffin birds is recovering. Gregory Stockel has this week's health and lifestyle report on whole genome testing. Later, we present a lesson of the day based on our video series "Let's Learn English." But first, here is John Russell. U.S. President Joe Biden will visit Vietnam on September 10th after attending the 2023 G20 Leaders Meeting in New Delhi, India. Biden is visiting Vietnam to raise relations between the countries to a new level, a comprehensive strategic partnership. Biden will not attend the Association of Southeast Asian Nations (ASEAN) leaders' meeting or summit in Indonesia's capital, Jakarta, from September fifth to seventh. Vice President Kamala Harris will attend instead of the president. Biden visited Indonesia last year when he attended the 2022 G20 Bali summit. At that time, Biden, along with Indonesian President Joko Widodo, announced aid for projects in areas including climate, security, and education. On Tuesday, White House Press Secretary Karin Jean-Pierre. Told VOA that Vietnam is a valuable partner for the United States as it develops ties in Southeast Asia. Indonesia has been a U.S. strategic partner since 2015. Vietnam is now ready to increase its relations with the U.S. after 10 years of comprehensive partnership. One reason Vietnam might now be ready to increase relations with the U.S. is because of China's activities in the South China Sea. China claims almost all the sea as its territory. Vietnam and China have conflicting claims in parts of the South China Sea and over many landforms there. Vietnam wants to protect its rights in the South China Sea by making partnerships that strengthen its position. Earlier this month, Biden said Vietnam wants relationships because they want China to know that they are not alone. The U.S. has supported Vietnam's maritime or sea security in the past. The U.S. provided two former U.S. Coast Guard ships to Vietnam, one in 2017 and another in 2021. Increased partnership would help Vietnam develop its technology industry. This would include production of semiconductors and development of artificial intelligence. Both these fields are areas of competition for the U.S. and China. Earlier this year, the ASEAN Studies Center in Singapore released a report about the opinions of people in Southeast Asia. The report found that among Southeast Asians, the United States was more popular than China, and that popularity increased from the year before. However, Indonesians appeared to be outliers. The percentage of Indonesians choosing the U.S. fell 18 percentage points from 2021 to 
Those choosing China rose by about the same number of percentage points during the same period. Ranga Aditya Elias is the head of international relations at Binus University in Indonesia. He said finding balance between the U.S. and China is the biggest homework for Indonesia. One way for Indonesia to find balance is to look to the U.S. to provide arms. Last week, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin met with Indonesian Defense Minister Prabowo Subianto in Washington. They announced their shared interest to increase Indonesia's ability to defend itself. I'm John Russell. Has launched a new program for children. It is called Let's Learn English with Anna. The new course aims to teach children American English through asking and answering questions and experiencing fun situations. For more information, visit our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. Scientists studying the Atlantic puffin population off the coast of Maine say the birds are now recovering after suffering major losses in 2021. Atlantic puffins look and walk similarly to penguins. Wildlife officials say reproductions for the animals on islands off the coast of Maine fell sharply in 2021. But last year, about two-thirds of puffins in the area produced young. While the numbers did not reach that same level this year, the birds still had a better year than in 2021. The main reason for the decreasing numbers is a drop in the population of small fish puffins feed on, such as herring. Two years ago, puffin colonies suffered one of the lowest reproduction rates in many years because of a lack of those fish. Only about one quarter of the birds were able to raise young in 2021. Environmental groups have linked the lower fish populations in the area to warming ocean temperatures, the Gulf of Maine, which has puffin colonies on its islands, is warming faster than most of the world's oceans. Some recent years have been especially warm, and local climate officials have said this summer appears to have been still unusually warm. Bill Seidman is the president and chief scientist at the Farallong Institute, a conservation organization based in California. He told the Associated Press the reasons for the puffin population drop include deadly heat waves, loss of food, loss of islands to sea level rise, and an inability to reproduce or breed. The problem with climate change is these breeding failures and low breeding productivity years are now becoming chronic, Seidman said. There will be fewer young birds in the population that are able to recruit into the breeding population. Maine's puffins are the only breeding Atlantic puffins in the United States. Worldwide, the species lives in the North Atlantic from Maine and Canada to Europe. 
other countries with large puffin populations, such as Iceland, have also seen their bird populations drop. The main puffin population once fell to only about seventy pairs in an area known as Matinicus Rock. Hunters who went after the birds for their meat and feathers had nearly destroyed them by the early 1900s. Stephen Cress is a scientist with the Audubon Society, who has sought to grow puffin colonies since the 1970s. His attempts included moving young puffins from Canada to Eastern Egg Rock, another small island in the area. Wildlife officials say adult birds in the colonies appear fairly strong, and it's likely the population is stable and it could still be growing," said Don Lyons. He is the director of conservation science at the National Audubon Society's Seabird Institute in Bremen, Maine. The difficulties facing seabirds make successful breeding seasons especially important," said P. D. Bursma. She is a University of Washington professor of biology and director of the university's Center for Ecosystem Sentinels. What that means is we should be more cautious and concerned. About reproductive failures and things like that, to make sure that in good years, everyone that wants to has a chance to breed, and do well, Bursma said. I'm Brian Lynn. Bryn Schultz nearly died two times when she was a baby. At one point, she needed emergency surgery for bleeding in her brain. No one knew what was wrong. Then, a test that looked at her full genetic details found a rare bleeding disorder. Catching the disorder early saved her life. You have this hopeless feeling when you don't really know what's going on," said her father, Mike Schultz. He noted that the test made a difference in finding the cause and getting her the right care that she needed almost immediately. Bryn, now four, got the genetic testing as part of a clinical trial. The results of which were published recently in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Testing all of the details of a person's genes is called whole genome testing. Whole genome tests are much better than narrowly targeted tests when it comes to finding genetic differences. Called abnormalities that can cause disease. The study found 49% of these abnormalities compared to 27% with more commonly used tests targeting only some genetic diseases. Whole genome tests could solve the problem of doing several narrowly targeted tests on babies. Which still might not find the disorder. Experts warn there are some problems because labs vary in how they understand results. Also, whole genome tests are costlier and less likely to be covered by insurance.
but researchers hope that whole genome tests will at some point be used for millions of hospitalized babies with rare and difficult conditions. The U.S. National Human Genome Research Institute has found that around 350 million people around the world live with rare disorders, and it found that about 80% of the more than 7,000 conditions are genetic. I've been doing clinical trials of babies for over 40 years, said study writer Dr. John Davis, chief of newborn medicine at Tufts Medical Center in Boston. It's not often that you can do something that you feel is going to really change the world and change clinical practice for everyone. The night Bryn was born, she had difficulty breathing. There was also some bleeding in her brain. So doctors gave her blood transfusions and tests for different bleeding problems. When Bryn was a month old, she had surgery after a huge brain bleed. Her mother, Lindsay Schultz, said no one was sure about her condition. I don't think we slept. I mean, watching your child nearly die in front of your eyes twice is a memory I'll never erase, she said. Then the Schultz family learned about the clinical trial. Bryn and both parents got the whole genome testing. The results came in less than a week later. She had a rare bleeding disorder. It affects an estimated 1 in 2 million to 1 in 3 million live births. She also had another condition that caused a severe reaction to some drugs. Doctors said the correct results would likely have taken more time or even missed with several narrow targeted tests. That is because targeted tests cover maybe 1,700 out of 20,000 genes. But whole genome testing captures more things, said Dr. Paul Kruzka of GeneDx. It is a company that provides whole genome testing but was not involved in the study. Dr. Jill Marin is a study writer and a chief of children's medicine at Women and Infants Hospital in Rhode Island. She said full genome tests generally cost about three times more than narrow tests and are not covered by public insurance in most U.S. states. Experts like her say that greater access to full genome tests is necessary if more children are going to be helped. I'm Gregory Stockel. was Gregory Stockel with this week's Health and Lifestyle Report. Gregory joins me now to talk more about the story. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Dan. So, is there anything else you'd like to tell me about the story? Well, I wanted to talk about a word, diagnose. In the story, I said, catching the disease, but I could have used diagnose. What does diagnose mean? Diagnose is a verb and it means to identify the nature of the medical condition of someone. The noun form of this verb is diagnosis. Hmm, that's interesting. There was another term in the story I was hoping you could explain. The story talks about narrowly targeted testing. Can you explain what the word narrow means? Sure. Narrow is an adjective that means including or involving a small number of things or people, or 
limited in range or amount. So, in the story, narrowly targeted tests are only testing for some genes, while whole genome testing tests all of the genes. That's really helpful. Thanks, Greg. I hope you come back soon. Thank you. Happy to be here. is Anna Mateo. And my name is Andrew Smith. And I'm Jill Robbins. In this part of the Learning English broadcast, you will hear us explain and help you do more with the language from our series, Let's Learn English. The series shows Anna in her work and life in Washington, D.C., Let's hear the rest of Anna's introduction. I am from a small town. It is nice, but there is no good job for me. Goodbye, small town. And hello, Washington, D.C. I want to learn about Washington. You want to learn English. Let's learn together. Let's learn English. At the beginning of the series, Anna and the people she meets use short sentences and say each word clearly. As the series continues, the sentences get longer and more advanced. However, there are things you can learn from the first lessons in the series even if you are not a beginner. For example, you can learn how to use word stress. Isn't that right, Jill? That is right. Jill, you did pronounce that sentence just the way I wanted you to, because today we are listening for the ways native speakers make sure that the things they say are clear. To do that, we simply say a word a bit louder and longer. This is what we call word stress. Let's listen to Anna meet Pete in lesson one of Let's Learn English. Hi, are you Anna? Yes. Hi there. Are you Pete? I am Pete. Normally, we simply say I'm instead of I am when we introduce ourselves. Like when I said earlier, I'm Jill Robbins. That's right. But sometimes we will say I am instead of I'm when we want to be very clear. In the video, this is the first time Pete meets Anna. And to make it clear to beginners of English, he says I am. So should people learning to speak English always say I am? instead of I'm? No. In fact, I'm is much more common. But the idea is that we can choose to separate words and put stress on them to show that they are important and to make things very easy to understand. For example, if I ask Jill if it's fun to teach English, she can say, it is fun to teach. You can hear that it is fun to teach sounds a little stronger than it's fun to teach. Now, let's listen to another Let's Learn English example of this stress on small words. In Lesson 5, Anna and her friend Marcia are visiting a friend's house. Anna thinks the kitchen is beautiful. And Marsha agrees. Listen to how Marsha makes it clear. Marsha, I am in the kitchen. It is a beautiful kitchen. It is beautiful. 
Marsha makes the word is longer and louder. It is beautiful. And I noticed that Anna stressed the word beautiful. It is a beautiful kitchen. So we can stress long words or short words. Many times the short words are forms of the verb be. For example, the three words am, is, are. Let's hear another example. This one from lesson seven. It is Anna's first day at work, and she is excited to meet people. See if you can notice where Anna adds stress when she speaks. Are you excited? Yes, I am excited. Hi there. I'm Anna. Hi Anna. I'm Anne. Nice to meet you. What are you doing? Um, I'm writing. You are writing. Did you hear the stress on the verb be when Anna said am and are? I did hear it. Let's play those sentences again for our listeners. Yes, I am excited. You are writing. I hope our listeners can hear how we add the stress to these words. And Jill, you just used stress to make it clear to me. That's true. I did use stress. Instead of saying I heard it, I said I did hear it. Grammatically, Jill did not have to use the word "did," because she was not asking a question. Nor was she making a statement negative. But native speakers sometimes add the words "do" or "did" simply to make their meaning stronger or clearer. Can you give our listeners another example? Sure. Instead of just saying, "I like to watch football," I can say, "I do like to watch football." By adding the word "do," I'm simply making my statement a little bit stronger, and trying to make it very clear that my statement is, in fact, true. That means you are adding a little emphasis to your statement. That's right. Emphasis means extra importance that we add to a statement, activity, or idea. Emphasis is spelled. E M P H A S I S. Emphasis is the noun form. The verb form is emphasize. It means to add importance or show that something is important. That's right. But if you don't want to say the word emphasize, you can just use the phrasal verb. Draw one's attention to something. Like we want to draw our listeners' attention to the Let's Learn English series of lessons on VOA Learning English. Exactly. Well, Jill, I think we've emphasized everything we wanted our listeners to learn today. Do you agree? I do agree. That's great. You're very agreeable today. I'm just trying to help everyone learn about word stress. I think you've been very helpful, and I'm sure our listeners will agree. Be sure to listen next time for more lessons on the Learning English broadcast. I'm Andrew Smith, and I'm Jill Robbins. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak.